Miracle. Good evening. And the time is 7 o'clock. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB, uh, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned for Apex Express. This is a listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending June 29th. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact numbers. As part of the Downtown Sound Series, the First Presbyterian Church in San Jose, 49 North 4th Street, presents a very special evening of jazz with Martin Mann and George Young on Saturday, June 23rd at 7.30 p.m. General admission is $20. Students and seniors $15 and children $10. For more information, please call 408 209 the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival presents pioneer lesbian feminist filmmaker Barbara Hammer's new documentary, Lover Other, a tribute to surrealist photographer Claude Cahoon. The screening is Wednesday, June 27th at 7.30 p.m. at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, 701 Mission Street in San Francisco. General admission is $8. For more information, call 415-978-ARTS. Berkeley East Bay Gray Panthers invite you to a free lecture, The Threat to American Civil Rights and Habeas Corpus with Ann Fagan Ginger of the Berkeley Mickle John Institute. The lecture on Wednesday, June 27th at 1.30 p.m will be at the North Berkeley Senior Center, 1901 Hearst. For more information, call 510-548-9696. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Please send your listings at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley, California, 94704. Fax them to 510-848-3812 or email us at calendar at KPFA. KPFA.org. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. The calendar is also available online at KPFA.org. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. And welcome to tonight's show. My name is G, and in the studio with me is Mr. Patrick. How you doing out there? I'm good. I'm good. We got some guests in the house. Yeah, and uh, Tallulah is uh, a friend of ours, yours, and we have another friend in there, too. Tonight, we got some folks in here tonight, which is good. Nice. <laughs> you know, we got a lot of things happening on Apex Express, uh, very serious things. The overall uh, theme of the show is trade. Some is positive. Uh, we're going to be looking at an exhibit called Galleon Trade, which links together three countries, Mexico, the United States, and the Philippines, through art in the Asian American and Filipino community. So we're going to be looking at that very interesting way of presenting the art following a very historic trade route. But first off, we're going to talk a little bit about a serious uh, situation, a serious problem, um, which has to do with sex trafficking and uh, the sex trade and abuse of it. Several years ago, Bali Reddy, Lockie Reddy, uh, his case, which uh, opened up the issue of trafficking in women. And what happened was that some of the women who he sponsored over to the United States he used uh, to um, have sexual sexual relationships with and uh, the problem really came to a head when these two young Indian women were found um, dead and injured in an apartment uh, owned by um, Bali Reddy, Lockie Reddy. One of the women died and this situation only revealed itself uh, when that woman died and this happened not a 
over in some third world country, but it actually happened in Berkeley, California. And this case motivated Tanya Bowie to become active in the issue of stopping sex trafficking. As a UC Berkeley student in gender and women's studies, she researched the sex trafficking problem on the Nepal Indian border. And in 2006, after a major Asian and Pacific Islander leadership conference, Bowie developed an action plan to stop sex trafficking. And she's also developed a petition to raise awareness of the issue. I'd like to say welcome to the show tonight, Tanya. Thank you. You know, I wanted to ask you real quick before we get into anything. Um, when people think of Nepal, they think of, uh, you know, hiking. They think of, you know, having a good time. Used to be smoking dope. Uh, kind of a Shangri-La situation. But uh, there's also another problem with the country and with its relationships with India on that border. Maybe you can get into a little bit of that, uh, that what you found out there. Sure, I'd love to share with you. The border between Nepal and India is actually a red line district. Red, red light district? Red light district, uh-huh. correct. Which means that it's very prone to uh, prostitution and sex work within that area. And um, Nepal and most of the girls who are trafficked, there are girls, also young women, and so female minors and young women, are trafficked um, without their consent and the girls travel with male traffickers and at the border the men are speak on behalf of them and the law enforcement often stop them to ask whether what for what purpose they would travel from one from Mumbai to Nepal from I'm sorry from Nepal to Mumbai and the law enforcement would often kind of ask whether what purpose they're leaving the country but most of the traffickers would often say that they are uncles or brothers or relatives who are doing business and need to move from Nepal to India. Um, when most of the time, when the girls are silent, basically sometimes some of the girls are actually they've been threatened by their trafficker in terms of they could be abused, they could harm their family in the long run, or it's a psychological thing which which causes them to not be vocal or seek help and ask the law enforcement for help. Um, in In my research, I actually analyzed a documentary called Highway to Hell, which is done by um, Mira Dewan, and she also, I also looked at, in addition to the silence of the girls and why they end up staying in this um, horrible condition, they um, she also interviewed some of the pimps and traffickers who were, in, and the people who ran the, the brothels. Um, some of the men would argue men who use the sex uh, services would argue that it's a, just a way to avoid rape and and i think mm, that, that's really strange yes in in their laws and i think i'm not too keen on their laws in india and in the region of the red light district so but what, how do they justify that it's the reason to avoid rape i mean i don't quite understand it the men believe that if prostitution is seen as a service and a business, therefore they they cannot convict it as rape. They cannot convict it? Convicted, um, men would get away with using the prostitution services. So in, in a district like this, the, what happens is that the men off, prostitution is a crime. So the men can get away with both prostitution services and with the idea most of the women are vulnerable and they don't want to be there but they end up um, giving in to the services the demands of the men mm-hmm. who are coming in but let me services. ask you this again you know I know that uh, when I'll give you another example and uh, in Japan uh, women were forced to be sexual slaves during World War II right. and their reason for setting up these institutions basically of sex slavery was that well it would prevent men from raping the local women if they had an outlet from these going to these brothels I mean that's their that was their excuse or their reason now is that what you're trying to explain correct okay so you know that's that's sort of that kind of argument okay the other thing too um, you know there's th- th- that area of Nepal I, 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 I'm assuming that it's a lot poorer than the rest of, I guess, Mumbai or India. Is that why there's so much trade between uh, women from another country, which is Nepal, into India? How did that get started? I mean, why did the women in Nepal, you know, become 
um, I guess, victims of this uh, this kind of trade. Economics is definitely one concern to why traffic, sex trafficking would happen. The border there is a very rural area, and a lot of the the young girls are um, not educated, or they're not going to school, and they're at home assisting with their families. And so, some of the girls who end up are encountered by men who approach them and ask them um, if they would like uh, a job or they would say if they would like to make some money for their families. And some of these children and girls, they actually fall for this and they follow these strangers and they end up putting themselves in a situation without knowing that they are going to be trafficked, had being handed from one trafficker to another and crossing that border. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that in the movie by Mira Nair, a very well-known movie called Salah on Bombay, she looks right at that. Uh, the woman who gets trafficked is Nepalese, and she gets trafficked to a brothel in Bombay or Mumbai. And uh, Mumbai, I guess, is known for its red light district, but then you said along that border, it's it's got a lot of um, red light districts all along that Indian uh, Nepal border. Is that still the case? I'm not sure. I can't. I haven't done research on it for a while, but I assume so. Uh huh. Now, how come it, that area is so lucrative? It, and it just seems like the, there's no. Is there a trafficking? I'm not trafficking, but the people that patrol there, or are they subject there, to. In terms of the border? Yeah, it, it seems like it would be heavily policed. Correct. The, the, the border control there, from my understanding of the documentary that I analyze, the law enforcement do make an effort to question the people who move from one from across the borders. But apparently just asking them is not enough. There, and there isn't any evidence of why, uh, if trafficking activities is happening right in, in front of their faces. And so as long as these girls who remain silent and who are afraid to speak up, trafficking conditions will continue to occur and the law the law I don't, I don't believe that the law the law enforcement there can detect trafficking mm -hmm. the other thing we're going to be talking about in a little while um, is just the whole issue of silence and how silence has prevented um, the resolution of a lot of this problem of the uh, sex trafficking industry uh, I know people that are immigrants can't really speak the language and that's one of the reasons I get trafficked but uh, also in the United States, there's that whole issue of the same thing. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. This is um, Apex Express. My name is G, and I'm talking with Tanya Bowie. And we're going to be right back after this uh, particular cut here on KPFA, which is 94.1 FM and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. And you can listen to us online at www.kpfa.org. And I want to say this next cut is by Kindred the Family Soul. So we'll take a listen to that and come right back.
listening to Kindred, the Family Soul. And that is off of the Hidden Beach recording. The cut is called What Happens Now? And exactly that is my question. We are here at Apex Express talking with Tanya Bui. My name is G. Talking about the whole issue of an underground traffic that is still a big problem, sex trafficking. And... Um, one of the issues that we started the show out with is the whole case in, in of all places, Berkeley, California, where uh, a major uh, real estate holder in the city of Berkeley, California, was actually convicted of, of uh, sex trafficking. And the whole upshot of that was that um, two poor women from poor families in, in his home country of South uh, Asia, India, were trafficked. Um, and they, their families in India were also sort of uh, kept silent because um, Bali Reddy, Lockie Reddy has a fairly prominent um, family in the old home country and these two women were from very poor families so that put pressure on the families and these girls um, not to say anything and that has become a real difficult issue about sex trafficking. Not only do you have people who are really... Um, victimized terribly but because of the shame i guess that it has people don't talk about it and it's very difficult to overcome that issue of being ashamed that that um is something that i think i wanted to ask tonya about and um as an organizer tonya i was just wondering what you thought of this and i'll go back to what's happened to apex express when we've tried to go and talk about this issue to other nonprofit organizations a lot of times they don't want to talk with us because they think that we're going to exploit the issue. A lot of times the issue of sex trade or anything to do with Asians and sex trade gets kind of this real exploitive sort of take on it. And I say, well, you know, we're an Asian American, Pacific Islander, uh, you know, a progressive community radio station, and still people give me a hard time. They really question me. They say, what do you... I get this feeling like they're looking at what my motives are, you know, because that whole issue of silence not only affects the victims, but it affects everyone that works with the issue. So how do you deal with a situation where silence is a big concern? Well, when the topic of sex often comes up, it silence follows it. And with an issue as big as sex trafficking, sex trafficking is not easy to talk about because of a lot of the trauma that um, some of the survivors and victims that go through. Especially, and when sex and sexual matters and sex trafficking and talking about sexual abuse and exploitation it remains a taboo subject within the Asian American community because of the stigmatiz stigmatization that's linked to it and um, and so when it comes to talking about the issue of sex trafficking um, and for the it, first it would depend from who is presenting the issue whether it's the activist or the survivor or the law enforcement or the the traffickers themselves but as an activist who have taken the approach as uh, raising awareness um, discussing sex trafficking can be done in a place where people can feel most comfortable and it could begin within just smaller spaces within the family or within among friends or within a community or you can even um, make it a much more mobile mobilization thing where you can bring in the community together and put together a, mm -hmm. a, a raising awareness, a symposium or a public forum, which is what I did for the sex trafficking obliteration petition campaign at UC Berkeley. And that was a campaign that you, st you started. Yeah, I started the campaign last summer um, in response to the Lucky Ready mm -hmm. case as, and um, I thought that it was a local issue and and sex trafficking is always represented as an international issue, which I agree, but it also happens here locally, and it does impact the Asian American community. Mm -hmm. I had a question. You had an example of somebody who was a victim of sex trafficking. Did, can you give us a sense about what she was saying or what she didn't want to say? Right. Um, well, first of all, one of the things that she didn't want to... Well, the this girl that I met, um, she had found a way to express 
in a more indirect way about her sex trafficking conditions through poetry. And um, being involved with the Stop campaign herself, she chose to read a poem in highlight of her own trafficking experiences. And one of the things that she pointed out was that sex trafficking should not be seen in the context of just prostitution and sex industry work, but it should also be looked at as and from another perspective that sexual exploitation comes in the form of rape and sexual abuse and child abuse and she gave me um, not gave me but um, in through her poetry she revealed that about her ch growing up and moving from one space to another by force and performing sexual acts with people that she that was within her family and within um, people that she knew and she but she told me that um, we should look at the aspect of sexual abuse as well and not just... Is she Asian American? Yes, she is Asian American. She is. That's, that's something that we don't hear about. I mean, we do. A lot of immigrants get trafficked, I think, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm really kind of surprised almost that she would come out and, you know, be public with it. When she read her poetry, was she... In publicly facing an audience when she was reading her poetry, or was this? Yes, she was. We, I, the staff campaign collaborated with the other Asian American um, student groups on campus. One of them was Southeast Asian um, Student mm -hmm. Coalition, and we put together a benefit concert. And the staff campaign held a spoken mm -hmm. word event within this benefit concert. And when well, she, how did she go ahead, she performed in front of um, an audience of more. Well, than how did she decide students. that she should speak out? Because a lot of people just won't. I actually asked her that why she wanted to and she felt that it's 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 been time she's been trying to heal and it's and being knowing that it's an Asian American issue and the fact that she has strong ties to it, the Asian the Asian aspect she wanted to bring it out to make it more visible to make it be heard and through I think that poetry format is a much more a more different way and a lighter way I think to address the issue versus coming out and just speaking about her experiences um, and so I wanted to ask you this other thing too that we going back to what I was mentioning before about Apex Express and in our experience trying to get people on air to talk about who are, are not victims or actually non-profits who kind of work with the victims but I get a sense that they don't want to talk either the, the people that represent the victims because they're afraid of the whole exploitation angle but if you don't say anything about a problem a lot of times it just festers right I understand the thing about people don't want it to be exploited anymore so what do you think about that I mean about you know, speaking out about it more. Um. I think speaking out is one of the most effective ways to talk about it. And I understand where the nonprofits are coming from and why they're hesitant to speak. It's because sex trafficking has always been presented as an issue that can, is used to sensationalize, especially in the media. And it's always framed within the context of prostitution and that the young female has been trafficked to the United States from a Southeast Asian country. And then it has is forced to work in a brothel to pay for her passage here in the United States. And that's the most common way. And I agree. And having these articles is, in effect, is a start on bringing the issue to light. But we should also re-examine and re-examine the representation of sex trafficking and how um, it's coincidentally an Asian issue, but at the same time, it's more a domestic issue and not, and it impacts. If we continuously present it as an Asian American issue, we ignore the other places where mm -hmm. trafficking, sex trafficking does happen. Let's uh, wind this up a little bit by talking about the petition that you've developed called uh, Sex Trafficking Obliteration Petition, which is to raise awareness about this issue, just exactly what we're talking about. So maybe a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, the petition basically argues that the current human trafficking legislation does not um, enforce the law enforcement to undergo trafficking courses where they are trained to monitor sex trafficking conditions. Currently, right now, according to the San Francisco Police Department, that all sex trafficking, sex trafficking is the equivalent of prostitution. And as a result, those 
from my stance, as a result, sex trafficking survivors are convicted as prostitutes, and I think it's important that this trafficking S component should be implemented in the current human trafficking bill、um, for California in order to ensure that sex trafficking survivors are not mistaken as prostitutes. So, in other words, they would be looked at instead of being a criminal, they would be looked at as a victim and eligible for help, or are they going to get deported if they're illegal? There are many、um, implications.、Uh, I'm sorry.、Um, There are many components to sex trafficking. In terms of the survivor, they do seek, they need, they they do seek resources once they are. But it's only if the traf the survivor is willing to admit that she has he or she has been trafficked, then they are guaranteed、um, services or a testimony to、um, to talk in court.、Um, but otherwise, when these sex when the Law enforcement is unable to detect whether these are trafficking conditions or they're not trafficking conditions, and they're just prostitution prostitution conditions. That causes for many survivors to not speak at all because they know that they are at risk、mm-hmm. of being arrested. And your campaign does what to alleviate that problem?、Um, the campaign basically will gather signatures. Um, from and we will send this petition. I'm hoping to gain a few thousand. I don't have an exact goal yet, but this petition will be sent to all of the legislators, the Congress people,、um, the Assembly、um, people, and and even our local representatives here, and try to get the word out that there's a flaw within、okay. the current human trafficking. Let me ask you this before we wind up: any way to get a hold of you? Any way to find out more about this petition if people are interested? Sure, the Stop Campaign、um, it has an email address, and you can to ask for、um, any questions.、Um, you can、uh, email me at、um, stop dot campaign at gmail dot com. The petition is also online.、Um, you can just Google in sex trafficking obliteration petition. Okay, and just.、Um One more time, I am talking to Tonya Bui, and she is. Maybe you can give out that、uh, the the Gmail thing one more time. Sure, it's stop dot campaign at gmail dot com. Okay, thanks so much. This is Apex Express, and the time is seven twenty eight. My name is G. We're here every Thursday night. If you want to get a hold of us, you can do so by going to www dot apexexpress dot org, where you can find more articles and more audio clips. As well as you can call us at five one zero eight four eight six seven six seven extension four six four or email us at apex at kpfa dot o r g. We are going to come back with some more music. We are going to come back with a look at historic、uh, trade route, positive trade route, positive art between the Philippines and the United States、uh, with some Asian American artists. So、um, you know, I want to kind of leave this heavy, heavy thing on a little bit lighter note, and I just want to say that this next piece is by Indian Ocean, and it is a group that I was hip to by this、um, friend of mine, Preeti, who works at KPFA. She herself is from India, and this group is、uh, going to be performing in a benefit for India. Actually, the name of the group is Indian Ocean, and they are going to be here July the 14th, July the 14th, in a benefit concert for Indian development. And they are really something. They are kind of a mix. They they kind of like traditional, contemporary, even kind of sound Hawaiian, even kind of sound South African a bit. So why don't we take a listen to this particular piece by Indian Ocean called Genie? It's、uh, cut number six, and we'll be right back. <laughs>
Listening to Indian Ocean, they'll be here at Chabot College Performing Arts in、uh, July the 14th. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that next month. This is Apex Express. My name is G. Patrick is on the boards, and it is time for our next segment. But first of all, I just want y'all to know that we are on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, 94.1 FM KPFA. That was a boom in there, right, my friend?、Um, that's okay. My ears are cool. And I just want to say that if you want to get a hold of us, you can go to www.apexexpress.org. And Patrick, what is the MySpace there for our hip hop show that we have the first week of every month? I, I believe, don't, do not quote me on this, I think it's www.myspace.com slash apexexpress. You are right. I just wanted to bring you on. so... Oh, nice. Yeah, I know. Such nice. nice Y'all hear me out there? You, I certainly can. You, your voice, yes, you know, because it's all, it's all compressed and everything. So I know you're hitting it really loud. Hey, you know, to, to make Patrick happy, if, if people are listening out there,、uh, please do call us at some point.、Uh, we would like to hear your feedback, et cetera. Our telephone number is 510 848 6767, e n t i o n 464. Next up here on Apex Express, we are going to be talking about、um, kind of a historic link through art. And it is、uh, the theme of、um, a particular,、uh, particular piece of,、um, a, rather, a project, very interestingly, is called Galleon Trade Ship Launch, which is exchanging culture following the old historic route between the United States, Mexico, and the Philippines. Now, an Oakland based artist, Filipino American artist Jennifer Wolford, started this exhibit.、Um, Um, after she went to Manila 
and visited uh, the city's very thriving alternative arts scene. And Jennifer's mission was to make and is to make the Pacific Ocean smaller by creating sustainable templates for uh, new grassroots art exchange. So this exhibit called Galleon Trade will launch Saturday, June the 30th. And the artists of this project will take over the former Tribune Tower Press Building in Oakland. And the Galleon Trade ship launch. This exhibit uh, will go to the Philippines. And it'll eventually go to Mexico. And it also goes to Hawaii, I understand. So here with us tonight is one of the artists, Christine Wong Yap. Hello, Christine. Hi, thanks for having me. And Mike Arcega, right? Mm-hmm. Hello. Thanks okay, for having us. yeah. Um, now, I was talking to you a little bit before, Christine, about the whole idea of the historic trade route between taking that idea of the, of the galleon trade route between um, California or the United States and the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And some people would say, well, you know, wasn't that beginning of colonization and isn't that kind of a way somebody could look at sort of this exchange? But uh, so what would you be you guys' comments to that? Well, I certainly think it's an exciting time for a kind of recasting of the trade routes towards a kind of a cultural exchange route because California and also Mexico are two uh, sources of immigrant populations. I'm sorry, for the Philippines and Mexico are two sources of immigrant um, populations in California. And it's kind of ripe for exchange because there's so many opportunities for exchange in other countries like throughout Europe and as well as like more industrialized nations in Asia. So to have an exchange in the Philippines, I think, is a really new idea. Mm -hmm. And San Francisco has a really amazing arts community, but it specializes sort of in an alternative art scene. And I think that's what resonates most with going to Manila. Yeah, you know, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Mike, in particular, I guess, um, uh, the we don't hear too much about the art scene in, in the Philippines, and this is an alternative art scene. And when they say alternative art scene, um, I know that they mean an alternative to some of the Western style art mm-hmm. that you'd see in the Philippines. And is it also? Um, I also understand it's an alternative to some of the more politicized work of of the large mural works, very right. colorful mural works showing the Katipunan right. fighting for independence. Is it also an alternative to that? I, I think it's not exactly um, directly alternative. Alternative. Um, it is. It has. It is inspired by Western traditions too, actually, um, because you know they're they're not living in a bubble. They're exposed to to what we see. They they have internet. I mean, it's. But it's alternative in the way that they um, exhibit themselves. It's a, a lot of DIY. There's not much money to host and program exhibitions, and a lot of it is has become kind of the social gathering. So. Um, by by, and I know that they look to the West also, but they they're also strongly you know in the East. Um, so they're kind of it's a it's a perfect place to kind of bridge the the two disparate uh, geographically disparate locations. And I think Jennifer Wofford's idea or uh, kind of rehashing of the Manila Galleon trade. Um, looking at it as not necessarily as a negative colonial um, historical event, but rather um, this more positive look at uh, the melding of cultures. Mm-hmm. How would you see that happening, though? I mean, because um, she's saying they want she wants to make a sustainable template mm-hmm. for doing these exchanges. So you guys, some of the artists in the United States, are going to go over to the Philippines and vice versa. The Filipino artists are coming here, right, right to the states. Right. So, as you said, in the Philippines, you can't really make too much of a living. And Asian-American artists who are participating in galleon trade, this exhibit, you know, you all struggling, too. Yeah. How are you going to make money to do this and bring each other over? Oh, but first, before you yeah. even answer this, I think a lot of people want to know what's the purpose of it. Why would you want to do the exchange, you know? What, what are people going to get out of it? Well, I've never been to the Philippines. I grew up in Daly City. I feel like I have a lot of affinity to uh, Filipino culture. And so many of the active artists here in the Bay Area are Filipino and, like Mike, deal with some of the kind of Filipino cultural issues in their work. Um, uh, Personally, I think the most important aspect of this project is not just the exhibitions, because there's more than one exhibition. There's different exhibitions going around, like the one in Honolulu is of Manila-based artists, this one of California-based artists going to Manila is different. 
Uh, but the most important part is us going there. And 10 of the 12 California artists are going there. And uh, in addition to the artists, there's also a contingent of scholars organized by Lucy Burns of UCLA who will be conducting panels. So beyond just having a show, we're going there, we're seeing the spaces, we're going to check out the different sites and go to salons and do meet and greets and uh, hear about perspectives that otherwise I don't think we would hear about. Mike, I know that I've seen some of your work and I believe some of your work deals with the Filipino-American experience and identity. Now, if you're going to show that in the Filipino uh, community, uh, in the Manila art, alternative art scene mm -hmm. in Manila, have you actually done that? And then, you know, they're, they're, they don't go through that kind of identity crisis, obviously. They're, they're kind of, you know, yeah. they know who they are in a way. But what's, what's going to yeah. be the reflection of, on their part? I don't know, but... Uh, I'm not, you know, I can't, I can't kind of read or guess what what they're gonna, how they're gonna interpret um, my work as, you know, as a Filipino American. But I mean, I was I was born there, but didn't kind of come into my artistic being until uh, much much later. Um, but I think that being Filipino, uh, from that perspective, it's such a jumbled culture as it is. I mean. I, I think for the better because um, you know before historically it's been it's been trading with Asia and Southeast Asia for a long long mm -hmm. long time and then um, out here comes the Spaniards you know and they colonize it for 250 years and that that brings a whole another perspective um, and a, a certain kind of identity to the to the, the culture mm -hmm. and then to add an American layer on top of that um, it's it's a it's a real complicated identity, and yeah. I think it's hard to be able to pinpoint. Um, you know, when they say a, alternative thriving art scene, mm -hmm. um, I, I was just wondering if if you've seen any of it, and if you have, how does that reflect what's going on in the Philippines, which is a real, like you said, a real combination of things. But at the same yeah. time, you know, if, if if you're a journalist there, you know, it's not easy to be a journalist and really report thoroughly on what's going on in that country. It's, it's still got a lot of political problems. Mm -hmm. What do these alternative artists? What do their does their art? What's the thrust of it? Does it generally reflect what's going on in the country? Um, well, last I was there was 2004, um, and it was it was actually a brief stay. But what was most um, kind of exciting about the the scene was the the community really the social the social grouping. I mean, they kind of. Uh, the work in itself is actually a lot of it is, is political, but I think it's the um, inventiveness of using of materials. Mm -hmm. um, here we can, you know, buy oil paints or, or mm -hmm. whatever, but they have to actually gather um, kind of their medium from mm -hmm. other more interesting places. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask you, too, you were saying that, you know, the Philippines has a lot of influence. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, do these alternative artists address, like, the indigenous influence? There's a lot of different indigenous people, communities in the yeah. Philippines, you know, and yeah. that's always been kind of an issue that's sort of difficult to, I think, you know, they don't want to seem like you were just co-opting somebody's yeah. indigenous, like, you know, people here, they just co-opt Native American mm -hmm. stuff and throw it in their art. That's kind of, you know, iffy, right? Yeah. But do they try and do that, though? I mean, in the Philippines? Or? I don't know. I haven't been there. But what I have seen at the Worth Rider Gallery earlier um, last year that Jennifer organized a show of a Philippine, Filipino artists. And the show that I saw from these artists was really interesting. And I think kind of the most energetic thing about it was that it was so experimental. It kind of had a sense of emerging. Mm -hmm. There was um, a little television set made out of found materials that had a light inside. And there was also, I think, kind of a sense of uh, um, kind of wanting to uh, move beyond uh, the social realist murals that you had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. And I thought one really interesting piece was this kind of conceptual work where all you saw at first was an envelope from the artist in the Philippines addressed to the curator, Jennifer. And you couldn't tell where the work was. You just thought it was like a found object. And actually, if you look really closely, the postage stamp was a photorealist painting. And I thought it was really interesting that he would do something where he could use all his skill to paint this beautiful miniature painting and have it canceled out in the act of 
uh, mm-hmm. coming to be part of the show. You know, I also wanted to say that, Christine, you've been like a graphic artist. I mean, I know you as a graphic artist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're going to be exhibiting at this particular art show that's uh, coming up. It is on Saturday, June the 30th. Real quick, what are people going to see of your art? My work there... Uh, is a sample of my latest work, which is about optimism and pessimism. And I make drawings, prints, sculptures, and installations. So the work at the event on the 30th, which is an auction and fundraiser, will be one drawing and one uh, sculpture. And I've been doing these presents that are just ribbons in three dimensions without the present inside. Oh, yeah, that would be good, nice to give to somebody. <laughs> Mike, real quick, what kind of things are people going to see on uh, uh, Saturday, June 30th? Uh, I've been working on these uh, sandpaper kind of cutouts. Uh, it involves the, the cutouts, um, kind of an outline with another sandpaper underneath. So it's kind of this camouflage. It's I, I think of it as referring to uh, the desert. Uh, kind of a lot of it is a military kind of um, mm-hmm. scenes. It's called landscape. So I play with a lot of words. <laughs> That's a good so. one, yeah. Um, I agree. This whole <laughs> problem that we're having yeah. in, in, in our administration is kind of a scrapey kind of thing. Right. Well, in addition, uh-huh. actually, to the galleon trade artists who have donated work to the art auction and fundraiser, there's also going to be um, a number of works. I think we have 40 works total by 33 artists. So a mm-hmm. lot of community members, including... Um, uh, Mario Ibarra Jr. and Renee Gertler and a lot of amazing artists like Aaron Noble have donated beautiful works um, for the benefit. And there will also be a DJ. It's a uh, $10 sliding scale. But there's also too, right? free, mm-hmm, free complimentary food, right? Uh-oh. Filipino <laughs> food. Watch out so, now, folks. Yeah, and Uh-oh. Joe Franco's DJing, okay. and there will be videos. Okay, cool. So it'll be a big old party, and I love that it's in Oakland, too. I places. know. I, I love that, too, especially <laughs> the old Tripping Tower, which now is being reconverted. So once again, Saturday, June the 30th, Galleon Trade ship launch it starts at 6, and the auction ends at 9, and the Tri- Tribune Press Building is at 410 12th Street in downtown Oakland, California, and um, the public tr- transportation is it's right close to the BART station. And if you want to know more information, you can go to this um, site, which is www.galleontrade.org. Again, that's www.galleontrade.org, and you can also see some of the pictures there. Again, uh, you guys, I want to thank you so much for coming on, Mike and Christine. This thank is you. to Apex Express. We're here every Thursday night, and station ID time is, this is KPFA 94.1 FM or KPFB in Berkeley, KFCS in Fresno or www.kpfa.org online and we're going to get into our calendar of events but before we do that I do want to play a little bit of music from Asian Crisis which is uh, a lot like this exhibit where they have taken music, percussion music from all over Asia put it together and this next piece is called Dita Gonon which is based on a scale uh, that you'll find in the southern Philippines among the uh, Maguindanao people. So let's listen to that, and then we're going to go right into our calendar of events.
And this is Apex Express. My name is G with our calendar of events. First up, in June of 1982, Chinese American Vincent Chin was killed in Detroit by two unemployed white auto workers who had been laid off recently. The racial epithets were directed at Chin and were about how Japan was taking over U.S. auto industry. And、um, that was the reason why Chin was beaten to death by these two men. And the two men got very, just basically got off very, with a very, very light sentence. But that whole case really galvanized、um, Asian Americans. Now, 25 years later, Asian Pacific Americans for Progress, in conjunction with the Chinese Historical Society of America, will mark this anniversary、um, by assessing the whole situation of what happened to Vincent Chin and the consequences on our communities today. So,、um, that event is going to be June the 27th, Wednesday at 6 30 at the Chinese for Affirmative Action location, which is、uh, 17 Walter Yu Lum Place in Chinatown, San Francisco. And you can RSVP to this particular event by going to events at C. HSA.org. And as part of this, they're going to be showing a film called Who Killed Vincent Chin? And that's Academy Award nominated documentary. Again, there's also going to be a panel featuring Helen Zia,、uh, a journalist, as well as scholars、um, and Yvonne Lee, SF Police Commissioner, and more folks involved in that. Again, that is the、uh, 27th of June at 6 30. And you can also go call this number for more information 4153911188, extension 108. And that's、uh, Chinese Historical Society of America. Also, on June the 23rd, we're going to have some fun with this some music. Um, and part of the summer break, music by Mr. Kiwi. Mr. Kiwi is a Filipino MC who has just come out with a new mixtape called Summer Exposure. And、um, this highly charged rapper is performing June 22nd, also Friday, at La Pena with、um, uh, Company of Profits. And that's at 9 p.m. And again, he's also going to be performing Saturday, June 23rd, a celebration of our youth and Kiwi with、uh, young folks who I think are trained,、uh, training to be、uh, MCs. Is that right, Mr. Fasser?、Mm-hmm. Mr. Yep. Yes, they, they do an MC、uh, hip hop workshop, workshop out there at the Filipino、uh, Community Center in Excelsior District. And、um, it's not just about rap, it's about,、um, about bringing the issues in your community and, 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 and putting that in your lyrics. Okay, that's、uh, also, you can contact to see more about this at this MySpace, which is、uh, myspace.com front slash kiwi. Also, talking about the Phil- Philam community and about domestic labor and the issues of immigrants, there is going to be、um, a, phot- a photography exhibit sponsored by Kearney Street Workshop called Domestic Labor, and、um, it opens、uh, with a reception. That's Tuesday, June the 26th. And for more information on that, you can go to www.kearneystreet.org. That's K E A R N Y Street.org. Also, Kearney Street is beginning to accept a p p l i c a t i o n for Asian and Pacific Islander artists. Want to be part of their annual Aperture Festival. So, again, Kearney Street Workshop is a good resource for many of the arts activities that are happening in the Bay Area. Also,、um, the traditional sounds of India with a jazz bent is happening at the Sangati Center in Oakland. And that's June the 23rd, which is Saturday, 7 30. And、uh, the group is going to be Facing East. That's the name of the group that's going to be there, which combines Carnatic South. Indian classical music with that of jazz and、uh, playing the saxophone, jazz saxophone with、uh, South Asian Carnatic music. So, if you're interested in that, you can find out more by going to Sangati Center. That's S A N G A T I C E N T R dot O R G. Also, what's happening is、um, there's going to be Um, a story, or rather a documentary, about the Filipino community. And there used to be quite a few Filipino communities in California. One of them,、uh, actually the largest Filipino, out- Filipino community outside of the Philippines, was located in Stockton, California. And there's going to be a documentary about that called Little Manila. And that is going to be happening on、um, Monday, January the 25th, Monday, June the 25th, excuse me, at the Saul Zance Media Center in Berkeley, California. So for more information on that, you can go. Go to 
510-295-4305. Again, that's 510-295-4305. If you want to see that special screening, this is Apex Express. My name is G. Again, if you want to contact us, you can go to um, apex at kpfa.org or you can call us at 510-848-6767, extension 464. I want to say thank you to Mr. Patrick over there sitting at the board. My pleasure. Controlling everything. And we're going to go out with some music by Asian Crisis. Again, a mix of percussion music from throughout Asia. We are a Pan-Asian uh, show here, here on Apex Express, uh, covering so much Asian, South Asian, Pacific Islander right here on KPFA. And we are going to go next to the Bonnie Simmons uh, show, music show, with um, special guests. I've been in for Bonnie. So thanks so much, and we will catch you next Thursday. I'm Dirk Richardson, inviting you to keep your radio tuned to 94.1